Excellencies, dear participants and dear friends, a very warm welcome to all of you to this high-level women's breakfast. The world is watching us. The Alliance is taking important decisions for the future as Russia continues its war of aggression against Ukraine, bringing death and destruction to the heart of Europe. At this historic moment for transatlantic security, when we make Ukraine and the Alliance even stronger, we also make our bonds stronger. Following the successful gathering of women ministers at last year's summit in Madrid, today we are getting again together to contribute to this discussion. This is a space that we have gained and that we can all be proud of. Because leadership matters and women's leadership matters, and we would like to see more women across the Alliance, even among NATO's leaders. But how can we leverage women's leadership? We have a collective responsibility to do more. We are here making the change that we seek, leading by example and inspiring women and girls to join us now and in the future. As we know, you can't be what you cannot see. Life is showing us how leadership manifests itself in a variety of ways, from politics to civil society. And this is why I'm particularly glad to have with us today a representative from civil society. Your strong leadership has paved the way for women's political representation and participation in peace and security matters. And you continue to be at the forefront of the women, peace and security agenda every day. In this critical time for our security and for international peace and stability, as we are facing multiple security challenges, our voices and leadership are vital. It is only through our diversity and inclusivity that we can get a comprehensive understanding of the world and find the right solutions for longer lasting and more sustainable peace. This is why we are establishing here this unique space to exchange on imperative issues to transatlantic security. NATO is an alliance of democracies based on our common values and at the same time we are also building a new alliance between women leaders, political and non. Leadership matters and I'm committed to continue to create and promote such spaces for dialogue. It is together that we can expand and enhance women's voices in peace and security. This summit is making Ukraine stronger as we set out a vision for its future and reaffirm that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. It is only with the inclusion of women's leadership and voices that this support will bring the change and results we want to achieve. I would like to thank Lithuania and all those who have worked hard to make this event happen. And it is now with great pleasure that I give the floor to Victoria Chmilite Nielsen, Speaker of the Seimas of the Republic of Lithuania. Victoria, the floor is yours. Good morning to this distinguished audience. Um, I'm so glad that we are meeting here today for this uh, early uh, working breakfast to discuss how we can empower women in the field of international security and foreign policy. I'm grateful to the NATO Secretary General's Special Representative for Women, Peace and Security, Ms. Irene Felin, for inviting me to co-host this breakfast and continue the tradition of convening women ministers for a special discussion. The topic of empowering women matters, as the credibility of the international structures depends, among other things, also on who is at the helm of leading them. Despite that I'm addressing this distinguished audience, the fact is that decision making and priority setting, especially in the foreign policy realm, remain largely in the hands of men. This is especially true of non-democratic countries which underlines the fact that democracy and gender equality correlate with one another and form a mutually strengthening relationship. 
I firmly be believe that by taking up leadership positions in such men-dominated areas as international policy, as defense, you, female leaders, do not only realize your own potential, pave the way to others, give example and inspiration to women in non-democratic societies, but also reinforce democracy. Today, there is a stronger sense than ever that democracies have to work together more closely, as autocratic regimes do a very good job of putting their efforts together. But I would also call for more solidarity and cooperation among women. There is a widespread attitude that women uh, tend to be more diplomatic, more inclined to resolving conflicts peacefully, perhaps even less ambitious than men. But I would argue that the defining feature of uh, female leadership, be it at the grassroots level or uh, in distinguished positions, is courage. We do not take up leadership positions lightly. But when we do, we uh, do it well, and there are no sacrifices that we are not willing to make. Take concrete examples, the democratic example of uh, Belarus 2020 uh, democratic movement spearheaded by free women. Svetlana Tsikhanovska today is among us. Take Iranian protests, young women became the symbol of it, many sacrificed their lives for it. Take Ukrainian women, they are fighting alongside on the front line together with men, they are performing miracles of public diplomacy, they are heading civil um, movements. Um, I know that we are talking uh, on the second day of the NATO summit and it is tempting to go into a discussion on the results of the first day. But let me say just this, let's um, just make uh, a commitment that um, the decisions from yesterday are just a stage in a long process and we will double our efforts to help Ukraine, to make sure that those women who are suffering and putting enormous weight on their shoulders will get uh, as much help as we can offer them, being in the privileged positions that we are. So um, I would like to take this opportunity to call us not just for a theoretical discussion on women's leadership, but for a discussion on very practical steps on how we can do more than before. Thank you. to invite Olga Stefanizna to join us. Thank you, Olga, for finding the time to be with us. That's very important for all. The stairs on the other side. So for all of us, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rena. Thank you, colleagues. Many, uh, many well-known faces. We've been meeting with many of you discussing various things. Of course, uh, here the major discussion has been taking place yesterday and we have already seen a uh, decision of, uh, of the leaders. And I probably want to start with the words of a strong gratitude to every ally, which is everybody almost around, uh, around the, uh, the 32 who have been really standing strong for us. Um, and uh, I probably want to be in a role to represent all the women in war. So we can speak, you know, a part of my job is also covering the gender equality issues, but uh, with the beginning of the full-scale war, it has totally different angle. Surviving the women, the families, most of the women who have been displaced, and also um, tackling the issues related to the war crimes against women committed by uh, Russian army as part of the military tactics, and uh, we have been discussing it in different circles many times. Um, probably, I think that the experience, the very sad experience now Ukraine has is, uh, is a unique one for a largest country in Europe facing the war with the hundreds and hundreds of women's men and elderly people who faced the sexual violence. Uh, 
millions of Ukrainian women who had to leave the country with their children and to be split with their family. Now, 500 days after the beginning of the full scale of war, we feel a lot of consequences of, uh, of this, um, uh, this horrible, uh, horrible war directly related to women. Um, but um, at the same time, uh, we did a lot in years before the full-scale war as part of the Women, Peace and Security Resolution. The action plans, our joint uh, work uh, within the alliance to leave no barriers for women in the armed forces. And now we have the situation with almost 40,000 Ukrainian women serving in the armed forces, and uh, many of them are on the senior positions, and many of them are on the front line. So we literally have no barriers for women in the armed forces, which is not the case for the, let's say, post-Soviet army format and uh, uh, and the thinking. So, um, but there is like a number of things I want to bring your attention to that with 24th of February, uh, we. Uh, have been treating this day as the day which has lifted any gender barriers. Because it wasn't about whether you have this or that position. It wasn't about whether you're a woman or a man. It was whether you wake up and stand up for your duty. And uh, I can only confirm that none of Ukrainian women had abandoned that, that duty. I think it's really important. And um, uh, I think that when we're talking about the decisions which have been taken yesterday, we're really sorry that that's, that's been very much behind the discussion and, and, and the wording. It wasn't that much about the substance and what we're ending up with uh, is, as, uh, we're, we're ending up with, the, with the, a set of conditions for Ukraine to become better than the best. Uh, I just want to to bring to your attention a couple of com comparisons that uh, we heard a lot of signals that uh, nobody wanted to irritate Russian Federation, nobody wanted to be clear, uh, in, those who, who were not in a position to think so, to clear in terms of uh, the decisions related to Ukraine's invitation to join uh, NATO, because it might affect the future negotiations and Ukraine might be traded in in the uh, issues related to the ending of this war uh, with Russia. We heard many, many things, but uh, it sounds very ridiculous to us because we are talking about the country which nearly failed to reach any of the declared goals of the war. We were not believed when we were showing our resolve we heard that Ukraine will fall without, within three days. This didn't happen. We heard that Ukraine will not be able to transform and reform itself while the war is raging on. We were not believed. But when Europe stood united for Ukraine and made a decision to grant Ukraine candidate statues, you saw that we managed to run the country fully, regardless of the war, to prepare everything related to accession in the bombshells throughout the country. But you didn't believe us. And we, when we were saying that Russia, in fact, is really weak, that less than within 24 hours, a small group of uh, private military officers managed to undermine the whole chain of statehood and Russian Federation and nearly find nobody in Kremlin, we were not believed. So probably it's part of the common belief and common understanding that it's better to see Russia as a huge and strong power than recognize that it's relative, that it's really weak. So, so there are many things on a discussion and I just wanted to ask that keep on believing Ukraine.
and when Ukraine says that it's really, really important that at this particular moment of time, when the hardest counteroffensive process and measures are taking place, when the uh, people are not able to come back to their countries, where we have survived the winter without light and water, when we still opening the survivor centers around the country, helping women, men, and other people in everything they might need to survive from, from the war. And when we reform ourselves, when we keep the institutions running, when we keep the social, medical, everything uh, working and operational, when we keep the banking sector running, the financial sector running generally in the country, when we reform our anti-corruption institutions and establishing the judicial, uh, judicial institutions uh, in the times of uh, war and make it operational. Just believe us when we say we want the decisions that would really change the situation in Ukraine, that will really bring morale. And I'm sure that we might be sorry of some things which have not been done, of something that Ukraine expected, when we will be successful in ending the war and bringing all Europe and all Ukraine to victory, when we will keep on running the country, showing that we are strong despite of everything. Uh, probably it's also seen with the very fact that the first, uh, the first area of responsibility I've been covering related to women's uh, never stopped being effective. All the infrastructure we managed to be in have been effective. All the women's received uh, support in the shelters. Uh, all the women's have been standing on the squares of the European cities and the cities across the Atlantic saying they need support, they need messages from the whole world, the messages of unity. So um, I'm really grateful to every one of you around this table. I know that uh, many of you step up and did the best you could. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse. Ukraine is uh, Ukraine and us as, as leaders, as political officials, as, as women in Ukraine, as mothers, there's no uh, negative feeling. It's just we feel that we could have done more and it really could have helped us back in Ukraine. It was needed for us, not against Russia, not because, uh, because it's just the wish list. It was so much needed. And the first uh, information from our side we were receiving from the front line yesterday. So there's still a lot of communication, a lot of things to be done, a lot of things to be, to be enforced uh, in the decisions taken, uh, ta taken yesterday. And we hope this will not become another uh, element of the historic uncertainty. You know Ukrainians, you know us. Uh, we are for certainty when it comes to the victory, when it comes to the membership of Ukraine in EU and NATO, when it comes to our territorial integrity and sovereignty, because we all know what is at stake and it's something beyond only Ukraine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olga. Thank you for your words, your strengths, and uh, for leading by example every day uh, as a woman, uh, as a political leader, uh, as a colleague, as a, as a friend. We are all with you. And uh, let me now uh, invite Yulia uh, uh, Karashvili to come to the floor. Thank you for this opportunity, Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen. It's very difficult for me to talk about uh, uh, after, after such an important speech, which 
comes directly to our hearts because Georgia also was suffering from several wars with Russia and we very well understand feelings and we very well understand how important is the support for Ukraine. I had the honor to be six years in Civil Society Advisory Council uh, for NATO and I know how important is women leadership from my personal experience because even bringing experience one of cases when during our CISAP meeting, Georgian IDP woman was kidnapped by Russian militaries and Deputy Secretary General Rose uh, Gottemüller personally was involved in her saving and it was very important for us and it was very important for her. In uh, 2015, after first Russian war against Ukraine, we civil society activists came together seeing how we can ensure support and solidarity with Ukrainian women and how we can support peace effort. At the time, we were thinking about peace dialogue and we saw that complexity of problem requires involvement of whole region, of whole our countries and all our powers from women from all post-Soviet countries. It was extremely important that it's how we created women's platform for peace dialogue. We had meeting recently and Iran was there also in Tbilisi and there were some messages also for international actors supporting us. And I will read a few. First, support solidarity actions with Ukrainian women. This could be also done not only by our solidarity, by, but inclusion of women activists from our countries to all strategic meetings and negotiations also at high level. And we saw today how important is women's speeches. Second, cooperate with and support civil society, women's organizations, groups, and women experts in all our countries where soft, so-called soft power and hybrid threats are now more and more intensive and where women's organizations and civil society needs your support and uh, your, your involvement. Third, support women activists also from invisible countries. And I know that Mrs. Tikhanovska is here and uh, Belarus and women activists, peace activists from Russia also are among these women who are strong providing strong support to Ukraine. Finally, I want to say a few words about my country, Georgia. Yesterday, it was very difficult for me not to hear clear messages about Georgia. And we in Georgia wait also the signals. Our society, our civil society, and all country, all population, which in 2008 clearly explained our wish, 85% of population gave clear message that we, we are pro-NATO and pro-European Union, and we need to keep this intention in Georgia. We need more NATO, we need more EU in our country. And especially now when more, more attempts are done uh, not to give Georgia a chance to do it. This is not only because we feel that we will be more secure where we will be NATO or EU. It's because we share the same values and we feel we are Europeans. We feel that Georgia deserves status within NATO and within EU. Women, Peace and Security Agenda is very important now as one of windows of opportunity to talk about human security and to talk about all of us. And uh, we think that uh, NATO can support efforts and women leaders, women grassroots, and women in very high political p positions if we can work together for achieving a real, sustainable, and fair peace in our countries. It will be our joint win. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Irene, who twice came to Georgia this year to support our intentions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia, for your words and uh, for being such a strong advocate for women's rights and uh, for the women, peace, and security agenda. It's now my pleasure to invite Hanna Celeste the head of the security programs at uh, Ukraine Prince to join us. Uh, and uh, she's also, uh, as I said, the, the director of security programs at the Foreign Policy Council Ukrainian Prism and editor-in-chief at Ukraine Analytica. Hanna, please, the Thank floor you, is Thank you, Ren. 
Uh, Your Excellency, dear colleagues, that is a great pleasure to see so many allies in uh, uh, this room, allies in NATO and allies in uh, our women leadership. And uh, that is quite a difficult to speak after Olga with all the uh, emotions uh, about what is the current affairs that all of us are sharing and emotions about the decisions. But at the same time, I would like to start from the statement that extraordinary times brings extraordinary leaders and extraordinary women. 2014 brought a lot of extraordinary Ukrainian women at the front lines. Uh, to the changes in the armed forces, uh, to the changes uh, in the uh, civil society, to the changes in the politics. Because that was the extraordinary times when not only the war, but the revolution, the revolution of dignity, opened these opportunities. And after the nine years of war, unfortunately, we saw the results of this extraordinary, uh, um, extraordinary time extraordinary leaders, extraordinary women are uh, coming to uh, power. But at the same time, we really understood the leadership in terms of women leadership appeared not only purely about the percentage of the top uh, positions. Uh, especially after February 2022, we started to see extraordinary women who've been doing a very small but extraordinary reforms at the lower levels, at the uh, level of the villages, at the level of the communities, at the level of those territories that been occupied, where uh, there were a lot of women in the resistance movement and leading the resistance movement against the occupants. We saw it in the occupied uh, villages where the women heads of these communities uh, led both the humanitarian and the resistance movement. We saw it at the front line when the volunteers Tears, you definitely can see that that is the so many female faces among those who are going to the very, very front line to save our boys. And that is so funny to hear this from the 20 years old volunteer. I'm going there to save our boys when she's speaking about the 50 years old soldier on the ground. But that is her leadership, how she could lead that support that changes. Paramedics who are over there, who are changing the whole paramedic system on the front line. But at the same time, I don't want us women to be leaders only at the extraordinary times. And I would like us to be better prepared for the times when the changes are needed. So when we already started speaking about the reconstruction of the country, about development of the country, after the war, even that I don't like this word after the war, Russia and Japan are still in the war. So probably we need to think about the different wording for this, not to provoke uh, uh, the Russian Federation to continue this war as long as uh, they would like, not as it takes for uh, you to support Ukraine, but as they like. So definitely I would like us already to think how to include more women into the reconstruction, into the development, uh, in the changes in the country that will lead more women to the decision-making process at all levels, not only at the levels of the statistics, but also in understanding that the gender equality and the gender agenda, it's not just about percentage or the quarters that we will have in the parliament or in the armed forces, but in the possibilities for the development. Yesterday we talked about how to, for example, make women to stay in the armed forces. Now we have, as Olga said, the 40,000 women with around 7,000 at the uh, officers and senior positions in the armed forces of Ukraine. Are we sure that we can have at least part of them still being in the armed forces if tomorrow we suddenly have a peace? How many of them would decide to return back and would like to be the leaders in their forces only during the extraordinary times of the war and crisis? Will we be able to have the same women um, being able to go to the politics or to the uh, local governance or to the other positions? These questions are still open because of the conditions. They can be good at the legislation level, but for me, the, always the question is how to transform these conditions in the legislation, in the uh, um, uh, aid, uh, development aid for Ukraine to the reality on the ground. And uh, that's why I, I will never stay between you and your coffee, because my coffee is uh, getting cold as well. But I would like us just to call uh, all of us to think how to be the leaders, not only at the extraordinary times, but how to create sustainable conditions to women 
during the war or after the war, not only in Ukraine, but in many countries, including the NATO allies countries, because I heard it from the, a lot of countries in the region as well, to be sustainable leaders in all those spheres where we occupy our positions. Thank you. And thank you for all the support for Ukraine within these years. Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you for this message that you gave, really saying that it's not uh, in the, ex the extraordinary circumstances in the summit. This is what I say every day at the office. It's important. I wanted to have this space, and I will promote and have to protect it, as I said. But it's every day that we need to continue our work, and this is what we are trying to do also at NATO, at our part, because otherwise, you know, it's, it's easier to do this when there are the special moments. But this is really the leadership on every day. Some housekeeping now. I will invite you to continue to enjoy the breakfast and to have the discussion and conversation after, at the table. We have, I know the ministry, the session uh, starts at, uh, at 9. We will have 20 minutes, about 20 minutes to discuss, but we can stay if, I mean, then I will conclude, but then uh, if you want to stay a little bit longer, the room is here for us and we can uh, continue, but then feel free after, you know, uh, the conclusion to leave for your com official uh, commitments. Thank you. <laughs>